second thing is I want to take us on a brief little trip to a couple of places. One of them is going to be SAS Visual Analytics, and the other is going to be over at Code Academy. And you should be able to see my screen right now, so hopefully you'll all be there. You go. There's two of us, and then there'll be others that will join. So I'm in week six, of, and this is or module six. And notice that we've already up. We you should have uploaded uh, lunches database six because I did it in the screencast part two last week, and I have a file there for you to upload for the demo credit. Okay, with me? Yes. And you'll see that lunch is database six. Now, each time I teach, every time I teach this course, I'll take a different set of code from that chapter, and it's on creating tables and working working with what we call data definition queries. And so I'll do some different. I'll do a different set of queries each time. But as long as you see the screencast. And you come in then and take a look at what I've done here and this one I've uploaded for you and you do a little re reverse engineering, you're good. Okay? Now I do want to bring your attention to what, I, what I'm going to do in terms of part two. Tonight will be, of course, part one. And in part two, I'll look at chapter seven. And for all intents and purposes, chapter seven is about sequences and indexes. All right? And the truth is, it's a little bit esoteric for what we want or what's important. Although, in terms of the performance of a database, it's just, it's, it's absolutely critical. But where you're going to get the most value is if you have the book beside you as I go through the screencast, and I'll cover Chapter 7, talk about it. There are a few queries in there that, we'll, that I'll run. But the main thing is to understand this about the indexing factor. When, when a machine, when a computer op uses an index, what it does is it will use prior searches or instructions that it's been given to go to a certain place to find things. This makes the search much faster. So let's say you have a million records, and out of that million records, 300,000 of them deal with, I don't know, um, Major League Baseball, and you're searching for something in Major League Baseball, rather than go all through all 100 million, all through, through all 1 million records, it will automatically focus in on those 300,000 records and do the search. And how it does it is, is it basically uses a system that mimics what we have out on the internet, and that is the use of cookies. If you, if, you, uh, if you go into the OBU website, you'll see they'll have a little thing that says, we use cookies here, okay? And they'll tell you, we use cookies to enhance your, your, uh, your, your viewing experience. What they're saying to you is the cookie is code that we embed in your machine or we embed in your browser. And then when you come back, it's just like we talked about a query being a view and it executes the code that's there, and then boom, the page loads and away you go. Got that? So it's the same principle in, in using an index. At one point in time when we worked with databases, we were very limited because we had to make linkages literally between phys a physical address in one place and a physical address in another in the machine. Then when we created what we then when we created what was called object-oriented programming, we were able to take code and treat it as an object so that we didn't have to we could store a table physically in a machine, but we didn't have to store query results. We could just execute the code. It's basically the same thing as happens with the cookies. Does that make sense? So it's helpful for you to understand it a little bit. It's a part of the chapter, and there's, there's, they walk you. The key parts of that are going to be over on page 348, 248, 249, where they talk about Oracle, for example, Oracle and Access data formats. Okay? Because they'll have those formats are set up 
for them to execute quickly because dates are really nothing more than an, are nothing more than an index. And so they're formatted uh, accordingly. Um, so I, like I said, I'll whip through that pretty fast. In Access, the, the GUI, the field properties, are, what, are, are, are gonna be an indicator of whether things are, are indexed or not. So, let, that being said, let's go over and go to the files section, okay? And you'll wanna go ahead and get those files that we're gonna need, the Patrick materials, okay? That's that zip, that's that zip file, okay? Download it to your desktop. Now I already have it on my machine, okay? But download it to your desktop, and inside of it, you're gonna find SQL Fund, that's the data warehouse that has all those tables. Then you're gonna find the code for each of these chapters, okay? And we're gonna work on chapter seven real quickly, and I'll work, I'm gonna work on it, but we'll, well, we'll take a look at it. We'll, we'll run a couple of queries. Yeah. We'll go through some queries and I want to, sh we'll look at some tables and I want to show you the, the, the uh, index portion. Fair enough? So I'm going to go ahead and take the SQL and I'm going to, that SQL fun, I'm going to dump it on my desktop and copy it there. And there is a familiar site, Cardinal Buddy, is happy, who is happy because, anybody know why Cardinal Buddy's happy? absolutely clinch the divisional playoffs and in the playoffs so they don't have to go play the dodgers that means they might last one round but then they have to, then they get to go to the dodgers and be slaughtered but that's okay they had a dramatic weekend over the cubs this has nothing to do with the course but it does go over and take a look at espn look at the standings you can go in and you can look at how they did versus the the dodgers versus the cubs versus the brewers that set of standings over there will let you do that search is really nothing more than a database. ESPN really is, it's a form. Uh, it's what we call a recommendation uh, a database that lets you plug in and find what you want and it will have other things to walk you through. And as you find them, it just builds a table on you. Anyway, for a long, to make a long story short, let's look at this and I'm gonna open up the SQL fund, okay? And again, like I said, this is our data warehouse. Why? Because it's filled with tables and very few queries. So every time we run a query here, it's not gonna change any of these tables except for in chapter six, when I did, when I created some tables and I did some data definition queries, and you'll wanna take a look at that. Screencast. Let's open up uh, departments. And see, that, oh, that's a dimension query, I don't want that. But again, if you hear me mention what a dimension query, this is a pardon me, table. This table is just used to build, if I want, drop down menus, i.e., dimensions that are about departments and they have the code and the name. It's also kind of a record. We talked about that some last week. And let's see, let me come down here to the tables. We've got the threes. And I'll find, let's see about if this is a fact table. Here, here we go. Okay. Now, this would be a fact table. Why? Well, it records a series of events or transactions. Okay. You see what I'm talking about? This is this SEC uh, 1509A. You see it? If you notice, it's got an ID number, so it has a primary key, so every record is unique. Then it has a dimension, the date that the lunch occurred, when, who, it has the employee ID. It has the date that that was entered. And because we have, because it has the date that, was, that it was entered, this is another piece of the fact table that helps me not only monitor the transaction that occurred or the event that occurred, but how soon I recorded it. 
and this would be the stuff with which I went in. If I go into, if I had a data audit, for example, someone's going to come in and take a look and do a sample to see how far removed transactions and events are from the date they're recorded. That's why forms are so important. And if we were, if we had a form here, we definitely would want the date entered or login data or anything that says, okay, I updated the database on this date or I ran a query. Okay. And I recorded it three weeks later. That's going to look funny to somebody because typically it ought to be boom, boom, boom like that. Um, this is a little far afield, but folks that uh, sell their services working with what we call click tracks, that is you and I go into a website and we click on a link and we click on a link and we do this and we do that. There are folks who have bots that will record our actions and every step of the way. And they'll take and, and they build in a timer that will tell them how long it was I stayed in the link. That's one of the ways that we use databases, and they'll put that into a database and they get a sense of who's staying in the link at looking at products, who's who's coming in looking at the same product three or four times a day, to start to give us a sense of this person's interested. Does that make sense? Yes, no? So let's click on that and let's go underneath and go into the design of this thing. Okay. And let's look at the lunch ID. Now that's a primary key. How do I know it's a primary key? What tells me? Do I get a view? Is there a visual cue that tells me it's a primary key? Exactly. It has a little key and that's a visual cue. One of the things about what we talk about, the graphic user interface, the, the GUI, is that it's icon driven. In other words, it gives us symbols that we can see and understand. And that is a great advantage. In the old days, when we worked on when we worked a database, we were at what we called the code level. I didn't have an icon, I had lines of code that stood for an object but now we can we can create the object and see it access like which is the mother of all databases gives you two visual cues one of them is in the object itself i.e the table and the other is upstairs pardon me not up in the ribbon area is it, you see in the ribbon area where it's hot it's darkened out got it it just becomes a force of habit of whether you like to do the tab or you like to look at the ribbon or both. It's just, it's designed to give you that visual cue. If you look down here, is this, is the lunch ID indexed? Okay, and, and you found that in what part of, of the GUI? Okay, you found it in the general and the field properties right in the very bottom. You saw index and it says yes, no duplicates. So we don't want to have any duplicate records. We can click on lunch date. It's not indexed. Employee ID. Let's see about that. Ah, duplicates okay. Let me ask you a question. Why would employee ID on this lunches table why would it be okay for us to have duplicates of an employee ID? What do you think? Yes, we're gonna have a multiple, we may have the same person have multiple lunches. So we have what we call there, the foreshadowing of a many to infinite number, okay? And we'll see this if we go back in. We looked last week at the database tools and we saw these tables and we saw some where the fields were linked. The table was linked and we saw a little, looked like a little pitchfork thing. That was saying I can have one employee who, who takes many lunches, one customer who hopefully buys many products, et cetera. Got? That's part of what we call an entity relationship diagram, an ERD. Not to fuss or worry about that, but the main thing you want to understand is 
about the duplicates that we use them, the indexing, that there are times when we, can, we want them duplicated and times when we don't. Make sense? Okay, since we're down here and we got this jewel open, let's go ahead for just a moment and click over on create and then let's diminish this down and let's go back into the Patrick materials and let's open up the code for chapter seven. Okay. And I want to just take a look at it for just a moment and let you see it. Now what I'm going now when I do the screencast part two, I'll run the code and all that business. But I think it's a good idea for us sometimes rather than just to read the code, I've read them to just slap the code in is to sometimes look at it and say, okay, what is this telling me in human speak? Okay. Now, I want to encourage you. If you can handle working with SQL, you can probably work with just about any other type of programming language. A programming languages tend to have some big elements and a key piece of them a key piece of it is the kind of command and control that we that we express in SQL. So if you get comfortable looking at SQL, you can probably learn just about anything. It'll just take you a little bit of time to add on to it. The most difficult programming you can do is data is is programming in in what we call uh, database management. We put a database together and then we embed it in some type of web, website or electronic interface. And then we have to marry it up with whatever environment it's hooking up with. Typically, if you hear people talk about electronic commerce and talk about the back office stuff where my vendor and I share a website and they order from me and I tell them what's in supply and all that business. Let's look at this 7-2 for just a second, okay? And somebody tell me, what fields are we going to get here? Okay, and then I have then I have a, a piece of I have a I have a keyword there format. Okay, and that, that I'm formatting another field, and that's the higher date. And notice that it's got single parenthesis, single quote, excuse me, and then a format by which we put that date in. Dates are uh, dates are like garlic is to Dracula <laughs> for programmers because dates are numbers, but they're not. They're a serial type of entity, but they're not. So working with Microsoft Access SQL versus Oracle SQL can become kind of problematic. And he talks about there at the bottom of page, he talks about that. And this is, this is over at the bottom of page 255 where he shows you that format. And you walk through that. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. The, at the, um, I'm so sorry, pardon me. At the, at the bottom, at the, near the bottom of page 250. Okay. Now we're going to get these fields. What what table are we working with? Can somebody tell me? What table? Employees table. Right. I'm getting the data from the employees table. Am I doing anything else with it? What else am I doing with it? Okay. I'm going to order it by the employee ID. So it starts with the first number, the second, the third, the fourth, until we've run out of employee IDs. And then we end the snippet of code there with the semicolon, okay? That makes sense? Now, when I run the code, when I do the video, you're gonna see the beginning table and then the result table, okay? But you can also see if you've got your book there, you take a look at it, page 250 and 251, it'll show you the beginning table, and then on the top of page 251 is the, is the ending table. Okay? And you got everything ordered nicely in terms of the employee ID. 
Let's look at 7.3, okay? Now here, I'm using an insert, okay? And what I'm doing is I'm inserting data into this section 0703 lunches table. And then I have some values I'm gonna insert. And I tell the machine the values I'm gonna insert. And then I wanna notice, I want you to notice something that now, what do you suppose that's all about? It says now. It's a function, and if you remember back when you worked in Excel, if you put equal now, it will do what? In the cell display, it'll give you the, the date, right? Equal now or equal today. Same story here, equal now, and you'll get that date. So you can get the values, 25, December 5th, 2011, 11.30 a.m., there's a date there. 202 and then the now. Now, when you look at this, you go, oh, what am I doing? That's the reason, again, we use forms. And I would have a form for this table so that I can get the data and I understand, or I can input, I can input the data, excuse me, and I understand what I'm doing. Most of the time, I'm going to have an end user, a customer, someone of that sort inputting the data into the table. Usually in the form, and, and they're usually making an order or they're registering or something like that. It's a transaction of types. Or I may have my employees, if I work in small, I place your input in the data. Okay? Um, So walk us through some stuff there in chapter seven on sequences. Uh, and about creating indexes. If you want to understand some of what we've, I've been talking about over there on page 264 and 265 in the text, they're going to talk about the optimizer and how an index works. Now, why is it important for you to understand about this a little bit? It's simple. The better an index and the more optimally it searches, the faster it is. And the faster it is, the more an end user is likely to find what they want when they want, or you're more likely to get the results of a search that you want. There's a reason Google has 86% of all advertising revenue on the internet. People can search and get stuff fast. They get millions of hits within half of a second. <laughs> it's gonna be interesting when the folks at Google go up and talk to the people at Congress about uh, antitrust. This is no different than what happened at the, at the start of the 20th century when you had the big oil and gas and timber and rail magnets going up to, and, and Teddy Roosevelt, the big trust buster. One of my heroes who said, you know, we're gonna break these companies apart for, for better competition. Well, folks are worried about Google being able to kill off little businesses because they have so much market power. Well, they have the market power they do because they have the kind of secret sauce in their algorithms that they can do the search. But that doesn't mean they need to crush everybody they encounter. Okay, so we'll see. We'll take a, I want you to take a look at that. Now, tonight we're gonna go over and we're gonna do a little bit of work with something different and just instead of just writing some code. So let's go back up to the desk and we'll go back over into the module. And we're gonna take a couple of trips. Here I have, I always like to provide you with some, with some extra information, some additional ways that you can learn and things that will build on The course material. I curate the curate curate these things, and I'll try to use them out of the use them out of the the, uh, the Commons usage policy. So it's just a link to somebody else. There are some sites there. The information builders that would be worth seeing. 
top 10 trends in data warehousing. Here's one, this place I love is this, is the Code Academy, okay? They've got all kinds of programs, they've got all kinds of um, self-paced courses for you to learn how to do code. And as I said last, last week, every time I start looking at it for jobs out in Monster or wherever, or I look at, or I, if I want to see the, the back end of that, that's the back, the front end, the back end of it, and I look for faculty qualifications, I see, can, I'm starting to see whether it's accounting, it's finance, or whatever. They want you to have some coding skill. And be it. The, I blew me away when I saw an, an ad for a, fa for a finance faculty member, and they wanted that person to know blockchain technology. I'm going, okay, great. Now, one of the places that we're going to go take a look is over at SAS Visual Analytics, okay? So let's take a look over there, and I have a link here on how to access it. And I'm going to change that out because it's, it's fairly – accurate but i'm going to get rid of it i'm going to show you tonight how to go there and you'll need to go get registered but i'll give you a quick little trip and let you see why i'm going to take you over there and i want you to have some experience with it so that when you go out and you visit with an employer you can honestly tell them yes i've had some experience with sas visual analytics and i'm going to show you the baby version i also want to show you a place out here it's teradata university okay Teradata University Network. As some of the folks from the University of Arkansas and, the University, and, and, and Oklahoma State University. And this is a fantastic place to come. So let me get myself logged in. Now I want you to come over here because you're gonna have an assignment dealing with this to kind of get your feet wet learning it and using it. And so you'll need to come over and get registered. When you get ready to register, the password, I think I have in there in, in, the, um, in, the, in Canvas is analytics. But I'm gonna go ahead and, and log in here. So I want you this week, if not, to, maybe if not tonight or tomorrow, to go over to Teradata and get registered. They have a free certification program. Uh, that folks like SAS, SAP, Oracle have worked with some universities to provide some baby versions of these products. Okay. Now I've logged in and you can see there the student passwords analytics. This is free. This is the thing that's so fantastic and so nice about it. It's free. Now, the cert, there's a certification program you can go through that you use almost all of their software. I, it, it's pretty low price. It's a pretty low price, but if you want something to enhan enhance your resume uh, your, when you get ready to go out to work, there's a way to do that. And you can come over here and get some valuable certification and experience using it. Now, I'm going to click on software. Okay. And then it's going to start to load up on me. Okay. And I'm going to come down here and I'm going to choose SAS Visual Analytics. Now, here's the thing that is so nice about this. The folks at those two universities and some people, other folks who are part of that, of the, of the, of the network, have partnered with SAS to let you and I see a baby version of what they sell, um, fifty to hundred thousand dollars, or a flat fee of that plus per client or customer that you serve. It's extremely expensive, but it's extremely good. And this is SaaS Visual Analytics is kind of the holy grail between the best elements of a database and the best elements of a spreadsheet, okay? The, having the ability to come over here and work with this and access it and use it, well, let's just see what the mother of all databases that is access morphed itself into 
and into a very, 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 very uh, nice application. And chances are you're going to be working with this. If you're going to work for a big company, you'll probably work for SAS Visual Analytics, and you're going to find it takes you some time, but once you kind of get used to working with it, it's uh, an extremely, extremely nice tool to work with. And the key, the thing that is so cool is it gives you charts that you won't believe. The charting capability is what makes it so powerful because you don't have to do all the work you have to do with Excel. So let's click on the Data Explorer. I'm going to click on that. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. And I'll add the Adobe Flash Player. And it's going to take it just a minute to load itself up. Okay. And I'm going to see, I want to select a data source. And I'm just going to show you what we did back from fall 16. Let's go load that up. And that's all I'll let you see now. We can go in and there's there's some data in there that you can work with, raw data that you can play around with. But this is from a project that I had everybody do back in the fall of 16. Right? And I'll let you take a look at it. This is why we use data warehouses and where I want, why I want you to understand them and then understand how we link them up to provide us this type of product. Now this is probably this is a real baby tool, but as when you hear people talk about dashboards, okay, you're going to see that it's just, it gives you some fantastic data. We'll let it load up here. It may take it a minute to do it. Sometimes it's a little bit slow. Now, this was, we were, this was a project that we did with uh, a, a, a company called Insight Toy. I'll help you load for me here. And while we're waiting, if you could see there, if you look on the grayed out parts, you're going to see over on the right hand side are some places where, like with a pivot table, okay, I can dump stuff for a category i.e. a dimension, a variable, and then for measures. And I had also, um, I had some options if I wanted to use some lattice rows and columns for the data. And I was able to create two or three different little visualizations, I think seven of them in fact, that I created. So let's see if it's gonna upload for us. It may be slow, well it is. Once it's up and going, it's nice. And there's probably a lot of people on it using it right now. If you look at the top here, and I'll just let you see, you can kind of see the little green as, as, as that cursor dances through. All of the different tables that you can create just with a click. And I'll and and I promise what I'll, I'll do back on when I do uh, the screencast part two. I'll go back in maybe when the data are, when it's a l less traffic. That's one of the issues we gonna get into with this. So let's go, I'm gonna let that jewel load itself up. I'll take you back over here to, let's go back over to Canvas for just a moment and I want to open up this link and I have a series of, I have a PDF for you with a series of screenshots from the older version of it as I walked everybody through. So you can see, we I mean, don't waste the time sitting there watching this silly thing spin. So we click this, that visual analytics. Okay. Then it would load. Of course, then tell us, you know, it takes a little bit to load it up. Then there are two things there. One of them is called a report designer. And the other is called a data explorer. The report designer is exactly what it says it is. It's a way I build a template if I want to take a set of data and build it, create a report. The data explorer says I already have a bunch of data I've uploaded, and now I want to I want to work with those data. Okay, 
and walk you down here. And there's a user guide, it's quite extensive. And then we select a data to a source and there's the Insight toy. Now, here's one of the first visualizations we created. And we're looking at here, we're, we're comparing different measures here, customer satisfaction, facility age, et cetera. You can see all of those I chose and it put it in, put it into a nice visualization for me. And all I really had to do was just click that to get those, to get those blocks. And of course, the deeper the color, color block, the higher the value. If I want to do that in Excel, it'd take me you know, quite a bit of time to put it together. I just clicked and good, I'm good to go. Okay. So let's see if we're still, if it's still loading over here. And if it is, no, here we are. There we are. And you can see these are four different visualizations of the data. And you'll notice, I want to show you something. Over here on this side, let me go ahead and get my annotator up here. Let me go draw. This side is where I essentially write, do a query, okay? And what I basically do is I choose a category, like a product line, okay, or a dimension, and then I choose a measure. If I wanna put some lattice columns in or lattice rows, I can do that. But here I just essentially, that's all I did was I chose a product line, my product line uh, cost of sales. So I have categories and measures, very easy. And if you go to put, if you, if you try to put a measure into a category, it'll give you a little red X and it'll stop you, vice versa. So it's exceptionally intuitive to use. Very, very easy to use. Now down here, I had, I used a box tree diagram, okay? And I looked at the product cost of sale by product line. And I looked, and I used the box plots that will let me create kind of an average and then see how things vary away from it. You follow? And the nice thing about these is I can export the data and if I want to, I can download the visualization or I can, if I have trouble doing that, I can take a screenshot and throw it into a report. Like I said, this is just the baby product, but you could see all of the different ways that I can visualize these data. It will give me an automatic chart, which will basically say, here's what you've put in here for measures and categories. And so here's what would look the best. If I want to change that, I can, if I want to just see the table, I can see that. If I want to do cross tabs, I can do a cross tab. Well, that's a very, very nice tool. And it, it it's, an expression of, again, a data warehouse linked up to a tool to take the data in there, do the query, like I did over here. What table am I gonna get this stuff from? And it, it will know the table, what field, and are there any fact data connected to that that I wanna get? So I get the product line, and then I'm going into a fact table, and I know that because I'm gonna get the product line and then I'm gonna get the cost of sales, the data for each of those. Got me? So I would like you to register over here and come over and play around with it. And you'll have an assignment later on in the course to create some visualizations, okay? Make sense? There's also the report designer function. It will give you samples of reports. Now I'm gonna say this, some of these are nonsensical. Tree diagrams, I don't know about, some of these others, just, they're novelties in my mind, so I wouldn't care too much about them. But some of these are quite nice. Now, I'm gonna click on the data here. And if I want to add a data source, I could do that. If I want to refresh the data sources, I could do it. But I'm just, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna create a new visualization. Now watch how hard this is. I'm gonna click new visualization. 
And well, what I need to do first of all is I want to go over here and I want to get, let me create a new one. I'm going to close this off. Okay. And I want to go ahead and update this. And I'm going to go ahead and create a new one. Okay. Notice I have brand new silo to pull up my categories and to pull up my measures. And so I'm going to get facility city. See, if I go to put it in here in measures, it won't let me because it's, it's categorical data. Throw it up here. Okay. And now I've got the frequency of, of, of the city here, a facility by city. No big deal at that point. Now I'm gonna go down and find a measure. And I wanna find, let's see, customer distance. I'm gonna call customer satisfaction measures. Okay? And it's gonna give me measures of customer satisfaction by facility city. And I think probably what I may add another one. And let's see customer distance. Let's see if it gives me something that's comprehensible. I'll maximize it up. Okay. Now there's a whole lot going on in here that I would want to simplify down. But again, at this point, if I'm wondering about you know, customer satisfaction in a particular city or cities, is, does distance have something to do with that? I've got a way to start. It takes me some time to get to a finished product, but it's gonna be a lot quicker than if I was having to try and design the charts and do all the work I'd have to do in Access or in Excel. Once you go in and, and, and go into SAS, and I'll show you some of the reports. I'll go ahead and leave that. And I'll click those reports up and lift those load up for us. I get the eraser, I'll get that stuff out of the way. Now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna click on the report designer. I'll feel load that for us pretty quickly. Now the, the cool thing about it is that this little kind of baby crude, which they would tell you is kind of their baby product, this was state of the art about 10 years ago. And so when you go, if you go to work for somebody that uses this tool, it's far more, far more intuitive and a lot more powerful and a lot more faster. And you can, you can maneuver around hundreds of thousands of records within 30 seconds, 20 seconds. You don't have this long kind of wait like we're dealing with right here. And you can put those data and look at them and visualize them in, in many, many numbers of ways which is exceptionally important for you because human beings respond to images. We're doing this whole course to teach you about data administration so that you understand the data warehouse is where everything starts. But when I extract it out of there, I've got to refine it. And I've got to make it into something that's, that, we, that is information, i.e. it's actionable data. Now, it's got some reports for us here. And it will show us a list table or cross tab. Display rules, properties. And so if I want to play around with this, I can just a little bit. And I'm going to look at the report viewer. And pop that open. The whole point of the report designer is to let you create a template. Does that make sense? So far? Now, I realize that we are but a wee small band of us. 
okay? But I'm a great believer that sometimes few people can do lots of great things. And I'm going to assure you that if you get locked into using some of these products like SAP, SAS, Oracle, not only will it be helpful for you when you go out and apply for a job, but if you have to make a decision that's gonna impact people's lives, which you're gonna be doing as a business leader or manager 99% of the time, then do the best, do it the best way you possibly can. Does that make sense? Yes, I hope so. Now, here's a capital exposure and risk report. Let's choose it, okay? And we'll look at it. I can print this report to the PDF. I can look at the report properties. I can email it. I can open it. Let's put it into PDF. Isn't that nice? So let's see if it's gonna give me a PDF report. I'm just gonna play nice with me. Here we are. Look at that. I just offered a report. Now I can click on this hyperlink and go through parts of the report, but they're showing me the exposure, capital risk exposure for this company by line of business, by, line, by industry, it's the allocated capital. Long, long time ago, I worked for a company that did mergers and acquisitions, okay? And I probably told this story before, I was part of a cash flow analysis team and what we did was we said, okay, if, these, if this company buys the other or if they join in hands together, and exchange rings in their forever link, what will happen? Because typically somebody in a merger or acquisition gets a payday. The payday is usually for the firm that's being acquired because they say, oh, you love me and you want to buy me? Fine, here I am, but I want a payday, okay? If two firms so somebody has to have an incentive. So our job is to say, all right, if they're gonna go borrow the money to do this, which is some, usually, it was usually a hedge fund of some type, will they generate the cash flow with this new entity in order, will they generate enough to pay, it, pay off interest? So we do cash flow scenarios and we do reports like this. If I could get, if we could give our team leader five scenarios in three months, we thought we were living large. When it got to the point where my officer's administrator's insurance cost more than what I was making as a consultant, because when people do a merger and acquisition, I remember one time the, they got $175 per share. So we had 1,000 shares of this company, you got 175 grand in your pocket. Boom, they were mad because they didn't get 180. Okay, so they sued. So I said, okay, I'm tired of this. I don't need any more of this. The last case I did, we did, we used Excel, we used SAS, and we were able to give them, we, were, we used Excel and we were able to use the optimizer and we gave them a thousand potential scenarios and then we gave them report with all of those. You can see how nicely done this is. This is just really nice stuff. Okay. I'm going to see that because I'm going to have a SAS Visual Analytics, Analytics uh, task for you there. And I'm going to have to do a little bit of adjusting on it. Is that a, a, to, to let us go ahead and use the Insight Toy Data. Okay. We've got about 30 minutes here, so I'm going to close this off. And, but I do, I would like you to go over and register at SAS Visual Analytics. Go over and play around. There's some other tools over there, some other resources. Um, go over to Teradata. And go over to their home. 
and we'll, back, we'll pop back to the software page and it's loading a little bit slow. But they have all kinds of stuff there for you to see in terms of what's going on and how folks are using analytics and all the products that are out there. And we'll pop back to the software here for a sec. It's a little bit slow. And for that one, I do apologize. Okay. So you'll maybe want to try to hit it at a time when it's not so heavy, but it's got things like sports analytics, all that kind of good stuff. All right. Now, let's go back over to the module. Pardon me. Let's go down to SQL phone, open it back up. All right. And we were working around, we were working with this idea of the indexes uh, and the data dictionary and all that business over in chapter seven. Okay. And chapter eight is where I want to take some time now for the next 30 minutes or so, and then we'll, we'll shut down and I'll do a, a part two for you on data integrity. So if you've got your book, okay, you should have it there. If not, then let's open up the code for chapter eight. Okay. And everything starts and ends with data integrity. If I don't have good data, I've got junk. That's all, that's all there is to it. So I have some techniques that I use to make sure that I have data integrity. And one of them is I add constraints. Now, if you look at 8.5 here, and I've got the chapter 8 code open up, okay? Can somebody tell me what I'm going to do to that table there? The section uh, 0805 employees table. What am I going to do to it? What's the first thing? What does it tell me I'm going to do? It's there in the cup. What am I going to do to it? Alter the section of 0805. Okay, I'm going to alter it. And what am I going to do? Exactly. I'm going to add a constraint, which means I'm going to limit the type of data or the format of the data that are inputted into a field. I'm going to add a constraint. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a primary key. That's what the PK means. It doesn't mean preacher's kid. First party I went to in college, eh, I won't forget that. It was preacher's kids and missionary kids. Let me say this. When they're away from home and mom and daddy, they are very different. I'll say no more. What stays at the party across the street in the old laundromat, what happened there stays there. I'll say no more. All oh, the good old days. Well, I guess so. Anyway, I'm going to add the constraint. I'm going to put in a primary key. And can somebody tell me what the primary key will be? This is hard. It's difficult. I don't know if you can get it. You're a genius. You're a genius. Now, I'm, I'm making fun. Here's the deal. Most of the time with programming, what you say and what you mean should be the same. They should be equivalent. Same thing with accounting or finance, working with numbers. Inside of some of you, is a computer programmer waiting, dying to get out. And somebody, there's an accountant saying, let me out. You don't have to be scared of those little numbers. But that's okay. You may find that you have an affinity for it. You never know. So I was being facetious, but let me say this. You looking at this code right now, you're miles ahead of your compatriots and you're going out into the most competitive job environment in the history of the world. You're competing against people from everywhere. I went off to a conference a couple of years ago and, and, and someone asked me about our courses. They had looked me up and then came into OB and looked at the business and they said, what are these BISS courses all about? 
And as I began to share with them, their eyes began to bug out. And I said, your students are going to be so far ahead of ours as they come out. It's not even funny. Technology is changing everything so fast, so rapidly that to be successful in business, you've got to be on top of it. You've got to understand it. No one is immune, no matter how large or how small they are, from understanding this. And coding, look, learning, a little, learning some coding like SQL, I showed you the link over there at the Code Academy. There's SQL, Python, any of those. They sound very exotic and scary, but they're really not. Now there's only there's one group of there's one bit of code in, in an application I would in, I'd encourage you to stay away from and it's called LaTeX and, and it's meant to replace Microsoft Word. Oh, there, I'm so sorry, I had a LaTeX disciple in the back. I was attacked at one by one at a conference last year. That's not true. It really didn't happen. But it, but if you'll what you're going to find is this. It's, it it kind of keeps your mind working because you're doing some critical thinking. You're doing some, you're using some logic. Let's look at the next one. Now I'm going to insert into this employee the following values. 201, Cheryl, Rose, sorry, no, no, which means an empty cell. 34, 3484, no, another empty cell. Now, if I had a table, if I had a form for that, it'd be simple. I just import, import the data. I don't have to write the code like I've got there. Does that make sense? This is the part that alternately delights and frustrates me. This stuff is not that hard. It's really not. It's really not that hard. And boy, if you can see the business model that it implies, then you're off to the races. Anybody here uh, read the book by Billy Bean? Anybody know about the book by Billy Bean? Moneyball? Yeah. You saw the movie. You saw the book, and you saw the movie, right? Okay. The analytics. Now. A lot of people laughed at that, but but I'm gonna, there's a team right now who's in the playoffs, who has an exceptionally bad stadium and a very low payroll, and they are the Oakland A's. Year in and year out, the big the if you follow baseball like I do because I'm an American and a good one, and those who follow other foreign sports should not. America baseball is invented by America. It was stolen by England, put in the form of rugby. Or cricket, 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 cricket. Anyway, that whole thing with analytics has really just taken over sports, especially with baseball. And year in and year out, these teams that will apply it do very well. The Cubs who broke the curse of the goat, I think it was the curse of the goat, or maybe it was the Red Sox. The Red Sox used analytics. They win a world championship first time in, I don't know, 100 years. Cubs use analytics when their first, when their first world championship in 100 years. And I'll take my, one of my favorite teams. My wife and I are, I'm a fan of the New York Yankees because many great Yankees grew up here. Anybody tell me one of the, the greatest Yankee who grew up, who lived and grew up in Oklahoma? Oh, Mickey Mantle, exactly. Yes, Mickey Mantle. Bobby Mercer, another great center fielder in a lost generation of Yankees who never made it to the World Series. But we're also Cardinal fans because I grew up, it's Cardinal country. My parents watched the Cardinals. The Cardinals are in the division playoffs. They, they did not, they have one all-star. One. They're the only team who has one all-star because they understand analytics. And they use them. Same story in business. And it all starts with this, with data administration and seeing a business model. Let me ask you a question while I'm being philosophical here. Why is Elvis Presley, why is his estate worth more today than it was when he was alive? 
The answer is not because he was consuming so many drugs, he diminished the cash flow of his estate. There was some of that, but why? What happened? They opened Graceland. Has anyone been to Graceland? <gasps> you have? My mother made me, yeah, my mother made me take her to her credit. His estate is worth more today because of franchising and digitization of his music. Every time his music's played on Spotify or every time it's played in a movie or anywhere, boom, they get a payday. And it wouldn't be possible if it hadn't been recorded and it wouldn't be possible if they hadn't taken those wax recordings and didn't want. Put them in digital format. There's a business model there. Anybody here a fan of TCM movies? Watch those? I am. That's TCM. You ought to see them. They got some great movies there. But it's a database. Ted Turner was a genius. He bought catalogs of movies from studios that were going bankrupt, and he packaged them together. Then now they have a website. They have a lot of events and all this. But the bottom line is it's a database. You can go in and search for the movies. You can find them. Same thing with IMBD. It's the same thing you folks do when you go in and you go into Hulu or wherever you go and you watch and you binge watch a movie or you binge watch a bunch of TV shows. How can you do that? Because they've all been stored digitally and they've been put into a database so you can execute a query and boom, you can watch all 57 issues of Dracula Bites Heidi on the neck. Version one, version two, all the neck biting, I'm not sure. I think it's a slippery, slippery slope that leads you to other places. And I would warn you young people, I'm just having fun. Let's look here at 810. And here we've got a, another query. And I'm gonna insert into this client's table, the values, Bill Hauser, Oregon 7, I think it's probably Oregon 700, and then I'm going to update the client's table, etc. All of these in Chapter 8 are where we start to build constraints into the table, and they're going to walk through where we build unique constraints in terms of there can only be one correct answer, or we'll use a primary key, or we'll use a format by which the data are entered. And you will see those as we work through them. So I'm really gonna I'm I'm really gonna encourage you to take a look over there at chapter eight as it talks about referential integrity. Referential referential integrity is really really important for one civil reason, and I know I've been going like a shooting information at you like water out of a fire hose. I'm gonna go back up here. I'm gonna find my database. I'm gonna open it up. And this is why data referential integrity is so important. Click on the database tools and then click on relationships. For some of you, that looks like your dating life. Doesn't it? But all of these tables are all connected if you take a look here for a moment, you're going to see the suppliers and look at the foods tables. I've moved it around. Look at all the ties coming into and out of it. Now, you'll notice when I look at the suppliers table into the foods table, I see there's, an, and I'm, I'm talking about this right here. And let me annotate, show you through the annotation real quick. Okay. Boom. Oh, I don't, I want to draw. I don't want lines. This has a one to many relationship, meaning I've got one supplier who sells me many types of foods or food products. Got that? If you're starting to see this and go, oh, this is a little bit boring, I've achieved my mission and now we just start to build on the queries and go from there.
a lot of companies don't know it, but they're in the database business. Pep Boys is an auto store. People go to Pep Boys and they do what? They, auto, they order auto parts, correct? If I don't have a database that shows me those parts and where to get them, I can't meet that person's order. And typically, if they're in typical, typically, it will be a car dealer who's working on vehicles that are maybe not new or they don't service as new vehicles. It might be they might have an older car that they're working on. Maybe it's Bob Moore and they're working on a, a 19, uh, a 27 Cadillac. Or it's, or, or it's Dobbs Tire Store who says, we'll do just about everything for you. And so they run a hot shot over to Pet Boys to get a muffler for a 1989 Honda CRX. They gotta have a database. You, I had a database when I was your age. That's probably a good note to close on. I dated, I kept notes. And it was her name, Sherry's, end of date, slap me. Marita, end of date, kick me. End of date, screamed and called please. Gentlemen, let me share one final piece with you. And this is kind of a thinking like a database. If at some point you're invited to a birthday luncheon, at the same time, at the same place, by three young ladies who dated you or previously dated you or who you thought did not know you were dating them, do not show up. It will be a bad day. I don't know by experience. I just simply heard it from someone it happened. It will be soon enough that you'll get to sit down and mentally go through a database as you catalog all of the false, all of the faults of your spouse. You'll have a list and you'll check it twice. And there'll be that time when you get to show them the list. You'll run a query and go, well, here's all the times. It you'll have queries on their family, their habits. I know you don't believe me. You get married, you go, mm -hmm. yeah. The new will wear off. Well, maybe that'll be, this was my experience. Okay, I've had all of you I can take. You've had all of me I can take, so. What I want you to upload is over there. Make sure you upload uh, number six, and that's over in Canada, okay? And I'm gonna go through chapter seven and do some more work with it. But what's due tonight is What's due Friday is the chapter, is a lunch database six. And I have one there for you. And I want you to take a look at it, kind of reverse engineer it. And then I'm, and then also please go over and get yourself registered at Teradata University. And for part two, I'll do chapter seven and chapter eight, okay? Started on both of those today, though, right? Yeah, we started on, okay. and if you want, go ahead and experiment with them and play with them. They're going to be due seven and seven and eight will be due next week. Yeah. Okay. God bless you, folks. Be careful. Have a nice weekend, and I'll see you next week. Ah, oh, but a faithful.